Hello, hello, beautiful humans. Today, Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. Phew, it's been. Hi. Welcome to it's my podcast. It's been a minute, huh? I didn't record an episode I last host, week. Well, please, this week Sky. I have a surprise for I you. Have I have a women really special guest here with me today. Being human. Um, over Sass years. is this podcast is where I disseminate some of those learning really cool work in the coaching world, and I'm so and glad I got a chance to, to interview her for human. all of you. Welcome. Um, so stay tuned for that in just a minute. But first. I just want to share something quite exciting um, that I shared on Instagram and I shared on Facebook and it's, I haven't shared it yet on the podcast. So if you don't follow me on Instagram at I am Thais Guy, join the conversation there. Um, But to all of you who don't do social media or may not be on social media right now, I have news. I got married. I'm very, very excited to share this with you all. Um, we actually, uh, we decided to elope. Uh, so we eloped in Joshua Tree and it was like a really, really magical experience. And it brought a lot of feelings about marriage and wedding and um, what does it mean to to engage in this new chapter of one's life. And so I've decided that I'm actually going to be recording a whole podcast episode where I'm going to go more in depth about Not necessarily my marriage, but like marriage in general, because this is a chapter in one's life for many of us. Many of us decide to embark in this idea of getting married, or many of us may want to get married. And I think that there's so much juice here to explore, particularly given our culture right now about what it means to be a feminist, what it means to be women's, you know, empowered, empowered women. And um, how do we navigate something like marriage, which has been uh, traditionally an opportunity for men to buy women? (laughs) Um, How do we navigate such an old institution in a way that feels an integrity with our values? So stay tuned for that. That is coming. Let me think if there's anything else that I want to share before I bring on SAS. I don't think so. So let's keep the intro super short. Let me bring on Sass, uh, her bio. Sass is a master coach and founder of the Self-Belief Coaching Academy. Sass hosts the Courage and Spice podcast, where she teaches evidence-based approaches and proven coaching tools to help you transcend your self-doubt. Uh, Sass helps you move from understanding the root causes of your self-doubt to cultivating tangible, sustainable self-belief, self-acceptance, self-worth, and self-trust. So cool. You can actually go to the show notes where I link for you her podcast, Courage and Spice. I link for you the Self-Belief Coaching Academy. Doors, I believe, are open right now, uh, which is great timing. Um, so you can go check that out. And SAS is doing a masterclass called Trauma-Informed Coaching. If you are in the coaching world and you want to hear a little bit about SAS's perspective on trauma-informed coaching, you can go to the show notes and sign up for that free masterclass. Um, and then you can also go to her website and uncover your self-doubt archetype. That's cool. I know so many of us love quizzes and love archetype things. So again, go to the show notes um, for the links to all of those things. Um, in this conversation, we're going to dive into what it means to be a trauma-informed coach. Um, and we're also going to talk about how to navigate self-doubt as a coach. And of course, this material is near and dear to my heart because I have a mentorship. And in my mentorship, I am exposed to so much self-doubt and so um, uh, much fear about what it means to be a coach and how to do it right, how to do it in a way that is an integrity. Um, it's been really cool to have this mentorship because I've been a little bit disconnected from the coaching world over the years. I tend to focus on my lane and not what everyone else is doing. And so having now a handful of people that I work with who are in the coaching industry, I've been really getting a sense of what the industry is doing. And there's so many things that are working and are wonderful and are supportive, like trauma-informed coaching. This was a new thing. This wasn't always the case. There's also things that are happening that I don't think are helping us in expanding the coaching industry in ways that are supportive, self-doubt being one of them. Um, There is such a pervasive fear and and, um, belief that if our work isn't super powerful and like transformative within five months, then we don't do good work. And in this episode, we talk a little bit about that and how to navigate that and how to use self-doubt as an actual tool for your coaching, not just something that is in your way. So without further ado, let's bring on this conversation. All right. Hello, hello, Sass. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm so excited to be here. This is fun. I have been 
angling to get you on my podcast for what six months now seven months now you're you're a hard to get woman (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad we're getting to do this me too me too and I am such a big fan of your work and I you know noticed that lately you've been talking a lot about this idea of trauma informed coaching um doing a free Mm -hmm. master class and all that good stuff so I thought like maybe let's start there Um, and see where our conversation goes. Yeah, perfect. Um, I think the best place to start, honestly, is like, let's even define, like, what, how do you define trauma-informed? Like, what does a trauma-informed coach, what does that mean for you when you say that? Such a good question. I think there's so many um, misconceptions about what it means to be a trauma-informed coach. And on from one angle it's almost an oxymoron because actually we don't don't touch trauma as coaches I don't think Um, I think that we are all about holding the person and sometimes because we live in our culture the people we work with carry trauma in their biography and so I think our job as coaches is to recognize the signs of trauma and to coach from within a coaching boundary that isn't about actually in any way provoking or creating a situation where that trauma is is touched on. It's much more about creating a place of safety for the client so that we can actually coach the part of them that is healthy and integrated and whole and resourced because that's the part that has brought them to coaching. And so I think our job as as the coach is really to recognize that trauma is there, to recognize that it is likely to kind of Uh, present itself sometimes in coaching sessions but our job as the coach is not to in any way try to touch that or to work with it we actually want to work with the healthy self of the client Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's hard when you know we just come out of a training certification program um, where you know, we, we've been many coaching certification programs, of course, not all. I know there are many exceptions and I and I advocate for those exceptions. But sadly, the majority of coaching certification programs, you get through to the other side having a toolkit of um, kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like almost like a transcript, right? like a, yeah. a guidebook of like, if they say this, this is what you say, or like, this is how you should focus on this. And I know that so many coaches go from that, a template, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, brain yeah. is working the this script, morning. right? Yeah. A script, yes, a template, a script, kind of like manualized coaching, so to speak. And then they get in front of actual humans and realize, oh, wait a minute, people are actually really complex. Yeah. And I can, I can imagine that, you know, for many coaches who don't necessarily want to do trauma work, um, but then are sit in front of, you know, these humans, I imagine that it can be very overwhelming to know what to do when trauma somehow comes up. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that even someone with trauma in their biography, we can't assume to know, <clears throat> excuse me, even someone with trauma in their biography that they may disclose to us and and lots of people don't we have no way of knowing what work they've already done where they are at in terms of their own healing journey if I can use such a cliched term and actually you know there's a ton of research that suggests that people do not need to talk about their trauma for it to heal Um, I think we need to be really interested in the client that's in front of us, not Mm -hmm. the avatar of the ideal person that we maybe described at a marketing workshop once, you know, and actually Mm -hmm. seeing that there is this dynamic and complex being 
who has access to lots of resources within them, even if they're not sure that those parts of them exist, but they have imagination and creativity and joy. They have discernment. They have self-compassion. They have access to their own qualities and strengths and emotions and needs. And our job, I think, is to help them to remember that that is who they really are underneath everything else, underneath their self-doubt and their, um, you know, the, the survival strategies that they may have come up with to kind of protect themselves. We have um, a job which is all about helping them to remember who they are underneath all of that. Mm-hmm. And um, that is that. there's no script for that. That's really about almost parking the script and saying, who are you, dear client? Help me get to know you so I can help you get to know you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really powerful and terrifying, right, to go from mm-hmm thinking, oh, I, I got this, you know, if I can just follow this script, or if I can just go by this, then, then I'll gain the confidence. And then to realize, oh, actually, I have no idea where to go from here. And I don't, you know, know how to swim in the same water where trauma may be, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are, like, how, how do you hold that there both may be trauma here and for the coaches who don't want to go into the trauma, not go into it? Well, I think part of it is about being really honest with the client, right? So mm-hmm. you can you can say, look, you know, let's get to know you. Even before I start working with a client, I'll, you know, and most coaches do this, right? We send sort of pre-session material and we get a sense of like, who is this person? And, you know, I always invite people to, you know, to tell me a bit about yourself. Like what have been the um, the parts of your life that feel significant that you want to share? What's led you to here? And go as far back as you wish. So for me, it's about respecting that the client's going to disclose whatever they think is important and whatever they feel safe to share. Um, and we can make some loose assumptions around what they're sharing and what that tells us about, you know, whether or not trauma is in their biography. Um, and, and, you know, part of this, I think, is just trusting that the client, you know, there's, there's a part of the client that's bringing them to coaching. They know that this isn't therapy. Um, And so part of it is about being really honest with the client around where the boundaries actually are. And if it's really obvious that someone has, you know, grown up with a lot of what you can see as a kind of complex or probably a traumatic upbringing, you know, we can talk about that. You know, what what has that meant for you? Where are you now with that? And what I'm interested in as the coach is how are those um, experiences showing up in the present moment, in the here and now? Well, you say a lot of really, really important things there that I want to slow you down on because, oh my gosh, (laughs) you know, I think you're making some really important points. One is that, you know, not all coaches who do deep work or who, who do deep meaningful work or who really want to do transformative work doesn't necessarily mean you have to do trauma work. And I think that yeah. right there is a big deal because I think what we're seeing now in the rise of the normalization of the language trauma, right, as tr- the word trauma becomes even more embedded in our nomenclature and the way in which we understand other humans, I think a lot of coaches feel this pressure that if their work is to be valid or to be meaningful, they have to do trauma work. And so you mm. essentially saying that that's not necessarily true and that evidence, you know, research supports that that's not necessarily true. I think it's a really big deal. Mm. Well, and, and I think there's a difference between being trauma informed or trauma aware and doing trauma work. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, I think that, uh, you know, and I'm a researcher by heart, you know, that's my 
that's the way that I sort of move through the world is I want to understand things. And, and I'm a lifelong learner. And I have found because I'm so devoted to coaching, um, this has been my work for the last decade, that my research into uh, my subject area, my sort of flavor of this work is self doubt. That's what I that's what I do. I work with humans with self doubt, and I teach coaches how to support their clients to transcend their self doubt. And I learned pretty early on that a lot of the root causes of self doubt um, are often very hurtful, sometimes traumatizing experiences. So I learned really early on that I needed to have some knowledge of that and, and some resources to be able to support my clients. But I was very clear, having because I've trained as a therapist as well, but I was very clear that therapy is not for me. That's not the work I particularly am moved by. So I, um, I should have sort of struck a happy medium, I think, in that I'm a trauma-informed coach and I've always had supervision. So I've had supervision for eight years. And mm-hmm. that has enabled me to, um, I think, feel supported and to really recognize the boundaries for me mm-hmm. of trauma and trauma work and what is kind of leaking into a therapized situation and what stays within the boundaries of coaching. Mm-hmm. So I think for coaches who want to do deep work with clients, who who want to do more perhaps than um, than surface stuff, you know, which is all about maybe time management or goal setting or, you know, that, that kind of stuff is really important. But I think if we want to get underneath and look at, more of the kind of developmental aspects of coaching, then having a, an understanding of trauma, of how it shows up, of where the boundaries are for us as individuals and for our clients is, is going to support us to know where to not go, to when to refer on or when to work in, um, in tandem with a therapist, with a client. Um, when to be part of a perhaps a, a wider support team for a client uh, and when it's it's just not okay for the client to be working with us where we think actually I'm right out of my depth here and okay. this person is not being best served by this work um, sometimes you know they come around afterwards they come back to you after they've you know worked with a therapist for a while um, but I think part of this is about being trauma informed or trauma aware is super important for coaches, but I don't think that we are here to work with trauma. I think that that sits outside of the coaching boundary as I understand it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that there are so many blurry lines. Um, and I, I often invite my clients who struggle with knowing what the difference is between therapy and coaching you know, to kind of cast away um, this question in terms of like, what is the world of therapy versus what is the world of coaching? Because there will never be an answer, I don't think. I think we can give, everyone is trying to tackle this. Everyone's trying to differentiate. But at the end of the day, you know, beyond like the obvious differentiators, when we're talking about actually sitting in front of people, it can get very blurry. Is listening a therapy or is it a coaching or is it a both, right? Is reflective listening? Is that, you know, like what, what parses those things out? And I often tell my clients instead, just focus on what work do you want to do? What is within your scope of competence? What feels really right for you to do? And that's all that matters. Um, And and that may be controversial. People may not like that. I ask that, but I often find that there are plenty of coaches who come from a therapy background who have done deep trauma work and they now are doing coaching work, but have an extensive trauma background. Who am I to say, oh, now that you call yourself a coach, you can't do that work. Maybe they're coming into the coaching realm because they want to work you know, in a different state, but they can still do that trauma, work, et cetera, et cetera. It's like we each mm. have to find our own scope of competence. And I love that, you know, you're, you've really felt out this scope of competence for yourself and really landed on like, this is what I want to work on. This is what feels satisfactory and po- potent and powerful for me. 
and I'm going to reside in this space and I'm going to really own this space. And Sass, I know that you've seen this so many times, but that's such a hard thing for so many coaches who experience that deep FOMO that if they're not doing, oh, what she's doing, what they're doing, what that looks like, then I'm not doing good work. Well, and and I would offer that that is actually a a sign for the coach to do some of their own healing work. Uh Mm Uh-huh. So so I I think that, you know, one of the great things about the internet is that we all get to see that we're all very similar, right? We all Mm -hmm. kind of have the same fears and doubts and worries. And the the kind of downside of it is that we all get to see what everyone else is doing. (laughs) And so that can (laughs) activate our own self-doubt. And as I think particularly for coaches who are new to this work or who are just kind of establishing themselves and really feeling out what are the boundaries of this work, if you yeah. don't have a therapy background, or you do, and, and lots, most coaches don't have a therapy background, yeah, um, then you're just going to be working with folks on, you know, their, you know, helping them to kind of up level some le- some area of their lives usually, yeah. right? Yeah. That's that's what we're here to do is how can we help our beloved clients kind of milk the shit out of their life in some way, right? <laughs> and so and so this work is, you know, fantastically imaginative and joyful and yeah. it's it's creative and it's all about helping our clients access their resources, you know, really see what can I do, you know, if I let go of all the reasons why I couldn't, all the stories I've believed about who I am and what my capacity and capability is, yeah. then that's coaching, right? That's the fun stuff. That's what we got into this work for. And I think, you know, there's also this element of, that somehow doing deep work means doing the stuff that's really hard, right? Yeah. And actually, yeah. I think that's that's sometimes a lie too, right? Like, I know for me, joy is one of the hardest emotions for me to feel. Yeah. So my deep work is into joy. For yeah. someone else, it will be it will be can I be with my own sadness? Yeah. For some people, it's can I learn to soothe myself and take care of myself? And for others, it's how can I connect with someone? So, you know, we have these kind of assumptions and beliefs about what's hard, what's meaningful, what's rich and deep. And that is going to be different for everybody. And part, I think, part of our healing work as, as practitioners is getting really okay with what we contribute. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I love that. I think um, there's such an, a belief as coaches. Again, I'm thinking a, a lot about myself when I first started thinking that I had to have these incredible toolkit of like fancy um, questions, worksheets. Like I had to have the fanciest kind of um, set of questions that was going to take you into yourself in this really deep, meaningful way, right? Yeah. I, I had so much pressure on myself that like to be a talented or skillful coach meant that I had to be able to ask just the right question in just the right way to really get them into this aha moment. And yeah. the more I've coached and the more training I've gotten, the more work I've done, the more I've seen that actually things can get, can be pretty simple and can still be completely revolutionary for an individual. You know, we don't we don't have to do this elaborate dance in order to support our clients in creating something really meaningful in their lives. Exactly. And you know, this whole thing of everyone has to have an aha moment. Like literally, can we let us, you know, take ourselves off the hook here? Yeah. Not every client has to have an aha moment in every session. Not every session needs to be tied up in a nice, neat bow. There yeah. is no right way or perfect question. Like I, if there's one thing I would say to any coach listening, it's there. there is no good coach model that you have to replicate or 
fit into. There is no mold for that. All you have to be is comfortable with yourself and taking care of you so that you can show up as the deepest, clearest presence for your for your clients. Yes. That's it. And it's amazing how that's so hard. <laughs> like it is so hard. Like I'm and I'm not trying to say that it's so, you know, like, yeah, just that little thing, right? I but I do think like there is this um I don't know, sometimes a sense of urgency that I sense from from coaches where, yeah, but how do I get to mastery or how do I get to, you know, be really, really good and ease filled at this? And, you know, the the shitty answer to that is about 100 hours, maybe 200 hours after you start. It will start, something will click into place. You will start to feel like I kind of know what I'm doing here. I, I sense where to go with this. Like yeah. we've, I think we've lost the value of an apprenticeship. Yes. You know? And I, I am such a devotee of this work and it has taken me the best part of eight years to feel like I've fulfilled my apprenticeship. Yes. And now that I'm sort of in this, you know, I'm entering the second decade of this work, I feel like, yeah, no, I kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, I, and I'm always surprised by my beloved clients. Like I'm, yeah. I always feel like I never quite know where it's going to go. And that's fun for me. That's yeah. the, that's the excitement of it. You know, it feels a bit like improv every single time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I think there is something about like just giving ourselves a break and saying, you know what, it's going to take some time and there's no quick way to it. Um, just get, just get lots of practice in. No one I, wants to hear that, right? No, no one wants to hear that. Sass. I mean, no one wants to. I mean, I, you know, in my training, um, as I work towards lic- licensure to become a clinical psychotherapist in the state of California, I have the opportunity to meet with kind of like the masters of the field, right? Like these would be like the master Jedis, right? Like these would be the folks who have dedicated their life to learning how to work with the force. And I can't believe that like I'm using Star Wars words right now. I'm not even that big of a Star Wars fan, but <laughs> you know, it's just thinking about like the level of mastery that these humans exhibit and the way that you're able to do like a case presentation and talk about a patient and they're able to like see through so much and make connections that you didn't even think of. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, like these people clearly are so brilliant. And then you ask them like, how long have they been doing this work? Mm. And they're, you know, Oh, I've been, I've been doing this work for 30 years. You know, like I've been seeing one-on-one patients you know, tw- at least 20 hours a week for 30 years. And it's, it's, it's a no brainer. It's like, oh, of course, of course mm. you can, you understand this work in a deeper way. You've earned, you've worked towards that. And I think that that is so frustrating for many of us who are perfectionists and many of us who want to do really good work right now. You know, I've had this conversation with my, with my partner where, I was really frustrated that like, I'm still new to um, couples work. So I'm doing couples work now. And like, I'm still so new to it. And there's so much to learn. And he's like, isn't that a good thing though, that you're learned that you don't know what, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it say something about your industry? If you could become a master at this very quickly, Um, it probably wouldn't be long-term a very meaningful industry. And, you know, he's totally on bar on point that, we need that we we need mastery to come from doing the work or else mm. it, it removes the magic of how special our industry is and and how mm. time matters time and experience matters mm. well and and i think it's also like i mean my my kind of the the sort of foundation for my work is in developmental psychology and adult developmental psychology and mm. you know part of development for us as adults is that we can hold increasing amounts of complexity yeah we can hold ambiguity and contradiction and paradox we're just more and more comfortable with that so that doesn't happen quickly 
right? We need that, we need space to be able to learn how to do that. And I think that, you know, this rush for the answer actually can keep us in some of the earlier stages of development where we just, we want the binary, right? We want someone to tell us, is it this or is it this? Right. And we can kind of fantasize about some easier, simpler, more perfect way to do this. If only I knew this, then it would be easy. Yeah. When actually it's it's not necessarily about finding the answers. It's about being with the uncertainty that increases our level of mastery. Well, and it's important to model that to our clients because our clients are going to pull that from us. Our clients want the answer. Our clients are hiring us. At least they think they're hiring us to get a specific answer. And so right. to model to them the sense of like, I'm not the authority. I don't have a secret answer. And can we tolerate ambiguity is a yeah. really powerful change agent for our clients to learn like, oh, I'm watching this person tolerate ambiguity. Maybe I can too. Oh, this person yeah. isn't taking taking it on that they're the expert of me. Maybe now I'm finally going to have to really look at how I am the expert of me. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that capacity for being with, you know, what else could be true here, right? If I'm not going to find the simple, perfect answer, what else is available to me? Yeah. And that ability to just be with what is can be an incredibly powerful resource for our clients. And so if we don't pretend to be some expert, right, because we're not, so we'd always be pretending. But if we actually say, you know what, I I really don't know what the answer is going to be, but you know what, I do trust that between us, we'll probably be able to figure something out. Yeah. It's like it, it removes this pressure from a client who might be thinking, everyone else has the answer. I didn't get given the manual for how to be an adult. Yeah. And so I'm just fumbling my way through. And what we are here, I think, to do is to model that, hey, look, no one knows what they're doing. We're all yeah. making this up as we go along. And the more we can be okay with that, the more we can go, oh, hang on. I do kind of know what I want to do here. I do sort of have the next step. I I think I could do this. And you start to kind of tap into some of that tolerance and the courage and the humor and creativity that being a grown up requires, right? And then suddenly, oh, maybe I don't have the manual, but I have something that works for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that is where self belief gets born as we start to accept that all of our imperfections and the parts of us that we didn't, we don't perhaps want or we wish we didn't have, but they are just part of us, right? The jealous parts and the angry parts and the frustrated parts and the bits that want it to be perfect. All of those parts are with us. And we kind of have the trust in ourselves to be able to make some choices and decisions. And whatever happens, we probably be okay because we always have. So part of this, I think, is about normalizing, um, you know, what it means to be a grown up, you know, in all of the ways that we might fancy up what coaching is. I think that when it comes down to it, it's that capacity to build some trust and acceptance and a sense of worth and a sense of uh, belief in ourselves. For me, that is like at the heart of the work that I do. Yeah. Well, you are the queen of self-doubt. (laughs) <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a funny way of putting it you you know have spent a lot of time really digging into this topic of self-doubt and I would love to hear a little bit of how did you go into the the realm of really trying to understand self-doubt what was it about self-doubt that you really gravitated towards um because it's such a, a interesting niche, you know, um, yeah. and 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 so prevalent, particularly as beginning coaches in the work. But as a beginner of anything, I think self doubt can be quite yeah. prevalent. Yeah, for sure. I I, um, I started off as a sort of very general life coach. I trained with the Coaches Training Institute, and then I 
trained with Martha Beck and I could see that I was helping my clients, but I didn't really understand why it worked or what was going on. And sometimes things didn't work. And so I was curious about why was that? And there is um, a master's program in coaching and mentoring at Oxford. And I pitched for it basically I just applied and I didn't even know because I'm not I'm not from the UK so I didn't even know if I would get in or if my degree from New Zealand would count but I was given a unconditional place and um, I got to go through a two-year master's program um, and we had as part of that we had to write a dissertation and I was really flummoxed as to what to write about and my um professor at the time just said well tell me a bit about coaching like just riff on that for a bit like what is it that coaching has taught you and I just said I think it has shown me that I have an enormous capacity to be with uncertainty Mm. and even though Mm. I've got a ton of self-doubt I can kind of be with that and it's okay. I can be with that with my clients and I can be with that in myself. And so it just has helped me to be with my own doubts and worries and fears. And she said, you should write about that. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of led me down the track. And I eventually thought, yeah, actually it's self-doubt that I want to look at. I want to understand what is the experience of self-doubt? Because I think most of us know when we're experiencing that, but it's quite hard to define and to name. Yeah. And it is what we call a phenomenological experience. So it is beyond just cognition and body sensation and, you know, our kind of all the bits in between. It is actually a a whole body experience. And so that was what I looked at was the phenomenology of self-doubt. And as part of that, experience I just made all of these connections about why I had had a massive amount of imposter syndrome for most of my life why I had dated the same person in different bodies for most of my adult life Mm -hmm. Um, all of the stuff that was personal to me suddenly started to uh, make sense to me and so after I completed my dissertation I thought, I really want to test out these findings. I want to see if this is true for my clients. And so I pretty quickly after that decided, right, I'm going to dedicate my coaching practice to self-doubt. And I've spent, you know, most of the last seven, eight years really diving into that. And so for me now, I see self-doubt as our built-in self-protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. It is there to tell us, in a squillion different ways, don't do that, you might hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's there to protect us from some specific risks, um, psychological risks, and those our sensitivity to those risks are usually based on what has happened to us in the past. So it doesn't really matter what we're doing. Like we could just be sending an email to a colleague, but if that email has the risk of conflict attached to it, we will find ourselves trying to resist the discomfort that that brings up for us. And we will engage in all kinds of resistant behavior like procrastinating or um, you know, drafting up the email 800 times and proving to ourselves that we've got the perfect right answer. Um, we'll do lots and lots of different things to try and avoid the discomfort that that sensitivity to that risk brings up. And so I wanted to find a way that I could both um, help folks to understand that that's what self-doubt is, it's self-protection, and to also um, kind of interrupt that pattern of how we get into those kind of resisting that discomfort and um, trying to soothe ourselves in these often quite um, unhelpful but understandable ways. And, um, and so that's what has really led me into this work. And over the last, um, gosh, the last eight years or so, I've sort of developed a, a methodology that I've you know, researched and tested with hundreds of clients. And now 
I'm teaching that to other coaches and, and therapists and practitioners. Um, and so, yeah, I now run the Self-Belief Coaching Academy where I teach other practitioners how they can support their clients. And all of this, uh, all of the approaches I use are trauma-informed and evidence-based. So folks know that they're getting kind of the cream of the crop in terms of how we can interrupt those patterns of, of self-doubt. Um, but, yeah, I love this work. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, I I can tell that you love it. I think it's so such a cool story. What has taken you to this, and to intersect it with what we were talking about earlier, I'm curious how you see um, self doubt really play a role in in coaching, like in beginner coaching. Where do you um, notice it play out the most? And then, you know, what do you tell coaches or I know it's more complicated than just telling a coach something but yeah. I guess I just want to love your, some of your thoughts or like what do you think about or, or what co- passes through your mind when you hear um, coaches experiencing doubt about their work because they're new to yeah. it because they're they're um, still trying to figure out their niche and how they want to work with people etc. Well I think I, I think it's perfectly understandable that anyone who is doing anything new that feels really important to them would experience self-doubt. Like, of course you would, right? Like this is an expression of our hearts and Mm -hmm. this work is often really meaningful. So it can feel like there's a lot at stake. Um, And I see um, the the, the coaches that I work with uh, tend to be existing practitioners. So they're kind of through that first sort of 100 hours or so of working with with clients but but some are kind of in that place as well and I think you know we we can kind of um, adopt survival strategies or ways of protecting ourselves that um, can be about things like distracting ourselves from feeling uncomfortable in a session like we might avoid um, or, or sort of gloss over any emotions that the clients bring up or we might rely on tools or exercises to avoid feeling really helpless. Um, we can try and control sessions or steer clients away from, um, from areas that feel uncomfortable to us. We dismiss our own blind spots. We don't ask for help. We don't seek supervision, right? We sort of stay in that place of trying to control everything. Um, and, and we can also, um, you know, use, use our own kind of approaches and tools against us. We can use like positive thinking to try and sort of bypass anything that feels uncomfortable to us or to soothe our clients whenever they start to feel or report feeling uncomfortable. Um, And we can get really consumed with the business side of being a coach. We have to, we sort of feel like extrinsic measures of success are the things that actually matter when actually it's much more it can be much more about our own work with clients and how our clients are reporting success can be, you know, another measure. Um, And I I think mostly we, we can get caught up in making our work mean a lot about us personally, rather than just this is our work and any, um, you know, any difficulty we're having with it is can be separated from us in some way. We can create that sort of um, that distance. It's just a healthy distance where we detach from the work, meaning something about us personally. Um, but I think that, you know, mostly it's really about being courageous, like mm-hmm. being willing to say the thing that we know will probably help our clients, but maybe we we don't want to say because we want to preserve the relationship or we we have some belief that if we say something that might be difficult for a client to hear, that somehow that will put that relationship at risk. Um, and we can decide that clients are difficult, right? <laughs> we, we just make a ton of assumptions about a client that doesn't show up in a way that feels good to us and so that can often be a way of trying to protect ourselves from feeling a little bit out of our depth or um, or just you know sometimes you're working with clients who are in difficulty they're not difficult people 
they are just in difficulty, which is almost mm-hmm. always the case. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so there's all these ways that I see, you know, self-doubt can be really insidious. It's quite sophisticated and we can tell ourselves lots of quite noble and um, quite understandable stories about what we think is going on, re- usually to protect ourselves. So while self-doubt is coming along and saying, hey, don't do that, you might hurt yourself, the the ways that we try to keep ourselves safe can also be about protecting ourselves. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why I always recommend that client uh, that coaches work with a supervisor, uh, which is, you know, something that is more and more common here in the UK. I'm not sure if, if it's kind of reaching the US in quite the same speed, but um, certainly for anyone who is working in a corporate environment over here or as an associate coach, there is a sort of expectation that you'd be in supervision. Um, but that can just really help with, you know, understanding where your own kind of blind spots and doubts are getting in the way of you being able to show up fully for your clients. Mm-hmm. I mean, as someone who runs a supervision group and who is in right now six hours of supervision a week, I can definitely attest to the potency and power of not having to do this alone. And one of the coolest things that I've found is that when we can start to understand our self-doubt, you know, in the ways that you talk about SAS and like really understand our own internal world of when self-doubt comes up and um, when we feel a certain way, it can become so informative of what's happening in the relationship. Yeah. Right. Like if you notice that you don't really experience self-doubt around one client, but you do around another. I mean, that is so much information about what may be going on within the client that is then coming through within you. Maybe they're feeling self-doubt and you're picking up on that and identifying with that and feeling it as your own, but it's not really yours. Or maybe Mm. there's something in the relational dynamic that um, they're trying to speak to, but can't put words to. And if you can sense into and talk about it, it may be a really big, important experience for that client to have. So what I love about your work and what I love about increasing self-awareness and our own ways in which we show up in this work is that we can then start to learn how to use this internal information to support our clients go, you know, deeper into whatever mastery they're seeking. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I think this is the this is the real work, I think, of of our um the real work of our coaching development is that if we sign up to work with other humans, I think we are the sort of unwritten law is that we're also signing up to work on ourselves. That's right. And and I I guess that's why I've always sort of found it. I'm I'm kind of intrigued and amazed <laughs> that people see coaching as a sort of lifestyle opportunity because I just right. think, how do you do that? Like <laughs> without, yeah. without reflecting on your own how you're showing up. You know, how mm-hmm. do you do that? I, I'm always quite fascinated by people who do that. But um for me, it's like, you know, the 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 healthiest coaching, the most successful coaching is going to be when the coach is coaching from their healthiest self. Yeah. Right. When we are able to be with our own, um, our own stuff and recognize it and heal it and forgive it. Um, it means that we can show up as this really clear, deep presence for our clients. Um, yeah. It means that we're, we're really able to notice and name whenever we feel activated in a session um, and we can kind of, you know, interrupt that pattern and you know, really come back to, oh, no, it, I'm okay, I'm safe, and I can I can hold this client, I can be with this person. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, afterwards we get to really reflect on what was going on for me, what was I feeling, you know, what happened to my kind of connection with my own body, who did that client become for me? Yeah. Um, you know, what was what was I feeling? What was I afraid of? What might be behind all of that? And that just that act of reflecting after a session that you have had some kind of activation happen can be so revealing yeah. and so important. 
Um, because you start to then notice over time, you'll notice patterns, you'll notice your own, you know, ways of trying to protect yourself or keep yourself psychologically safe. And it's always a perception, I think, of, of you know, what's safe and what isn't safe. Um, and usually that's based on, you know, our own experiences. So, you know, we think something bad is going to happen if we say the thing or if we um, acknowledge what we're you know, what we're seeing. Sometimes, you know, even just saying to a client, you know, something doesn't feel, something feels a bit off for me here. What's happening for you right now? Rather than, oh, I just don't even care what they're saying anymore. Or I've totally lost the train of thought that I had, you know. Um, We start to actually lean into what's coming up rather than, you know, avoid or or kind of, uh, you know, get into that sort of place of, of trying to protect ourselves. I love it. I love that so much. Um, and I am aware of the time and I'm like, oh, I just feel like I could keep going and talking <laughs> about this because, you know, it's so heartwarming to find other coaches out there who are doing work in such integrity. And I feel like all of the coaches that I feature on my podcast um, I, I find it really important, um, to only, you know, interview coaches who I feel have real integrity. And so, you know, I love your work. I love the work that you do in the world. I will put a link in the show notes to your podcast and to, um, your coaching certification program. Um, remind me the name cause it's, it's self-belief. Yes. Yeah. The self-belief, self-belief. Academy. Yeah, Self Belief Coaching Academy. Yeah. Oh, love that. Okay, yeah. I'll link that too. Um, and do you have any final words for us before we wrap up? Um, just that if you feel called to this work, then you're in such good company. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I really genuinely feel like most thinking coaches really want to show up in a really healthy way. I, I just don't think that. Um, anything we do that maybe feels a little off, it comes from a place of maliciousness. And it's very few people do this yeah. work because of that. So, I, you know, I really just think if you can let go of any notion that you have to be the good coach and just be you and yeah. forgive your learning process, let it be long and let it be deep. Um, ask for help. You're so not alone. Um, and you know, this, I think this is the best job in the world and I just wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you for having me, Tyson. It's so nice to, to finally chat. Agreed. Yes. Agreed.